Good evening. This is Redwood Wonk. My name is Eric Kirk. I'm with Dave Frank, and uh, we are going to discuss the nation's politics. The topics are pretty much the same as they've been through the past few weeks. A little bit of uh, an addition. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Newsom uh, recall attempt, which is heating up. But you know, the first thing in in the news that's making the headlines is. Um, the the COVID, uh, the new variants. Um, some some Democrats want to refer to it as the mega variant. Um, you know, but the the politics are continuing. DeSantis and Abbott doubling down on their anti anti mask law uh, or in uh, orders. Uh, they're being challenged in court. Um, in Texas, uh, a, a judge has put a temporary restraining order on Abbott. Abbott has vowed to fight for the freedom, even as the COVID in his state is just getting ridiculous, uh, the worst that it's been. DeSantis also lost a court decision, at least for the time being. Norwegian cruises uh, won uh, the ability to impose a um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, pass vaccine passport requirement to get onto their ships. Um, DeSantis, uh, they're they're calling him Death Santis uh, in in the Democratic uh, world. There's a, it's uh, he had a little bit of a joust with Biden where he apparently brought up immigration, open question as to whether or not he was trying to blame Florida's increase in infections on on immigration, but he was definitely trying to defer back. Well, you fix immigration, right? It, again, that's, that's the default. Um, but uh, DeSantis is slipping in the polls. Um, Christ, who was about 20 points behind a few weeks ago, was only about two points behind in a recent poll. Um, so uh, what is happening, Dave? Um, yeah, so as you said, the uh, governors, uh, uh, Abbott of Texas and no uh, DeSantis from Florida, Noam from uh, South Dakota, they're all kind of running uh, full steam ahead with the political posturing of the moment that keeps them at the forefront, I would say, of the national movement of the party to kind of parallel track uh, the legacy of Trump, which is, you know, be, fight back against these, these, uh, you know, the anything to do with the scientific or reasonable, rational, logical approach. Instead, they're favoring uh, liberty and uh, and just uh, the contrarian perspective of pushing back against state power. Um, also, it's not just the governors um, with, with national profile. People like Senator Cruz is out there today saying that no, nobody should have a mandate for anything. Basically, we shouldn't have any mandates at all. We'd like maximize our liberty. So it's sort of predictable in that sense. But meanwhile, it's like a tell two cities, I would say, just as a reminder, for folks kind of checking in. Some people don't look at the data as regularly as we do, uh, but unfortunately daily cases now, according to the New York Times, have reached 118,000 per day. So in the very near future, that's going to be a million new cases a week. Um, daily deaths are doubling every two weeks, which is now at 600 per day, which that's already more than a 9-11 uh, number of deaths per week. Um, so it really is we're reaching a territory um, that is pretty tragic and even in places like and more so uh, places like Florida, Louisiana, Hawaii, they're already at their worst uh, caseloads of the entire pandemic. So like whether you're talking about, um, you know, particular vaccine mandates um, for, uh, you know, politically imposed or, or, or mask mandates or for that matter, um, you know, the, the, the talk about um, state authority and state power, that seems to be, the, you know, the Republicans are getting a lot of, they're getting a lot of airtime, contrary to actually uh, what people's real experiences are with uh, the science and the public health uh, reality. Yeah, well, it would be nice if uh, Senator Cruz uh, was as concerned about mandates against abortion, something like that. You know, I mean, it's yeah. uh, he's he, there's there's a lot to um, to to be said about all of this. But if you look at the COVID maps as to where the infections are spreading, the South. Florida, all all the way over to Texas, it's deep red on the New York Times map. Just you know, in ter of everything, uh, increased infections, deaths, um, and uh, it's interesting because you know, we, as we reported last week, one of the governors, I believe in um, 
was it Al- well Alabama actually they've been trying to get she's been trying to get people to vaccinate she was expressed frustration on it a couple of weeks ago I believe in Arkansas it, as we reported last week the governor um, has uh, remorse for having yeah. passed the anti-mask uh, mandate. And it's very interesting breed of conservatives that, you know, typically argues for local control, right? But they don't want local control in, right. in this case. They want uh, they, they want everybody to be barred from it. And, uh, you know, if you're cynical, it's maybe because they don't want to have a whole lot of differences between the blue areas and the red areas in their state because it makes them look bad. Yeah, I mean that's definitely the case. I would say um, that that's that's a real that's a real problem. Um, and so so what's the timing of this all, right? So we're now uh, approaching middle of August. Some places are already going back to school. Others are going to be going back within the next you know two, four, even maybe even six weeks out. Um, so so there are you know within the population, the families, the parents in particular. Um, uh, they, they're really concerned about what's next. What do we do? Um, and as we hear about the uh, younger and younger folks getting uh, having Ill, Ill effects um, and, you know, granted, it is the vast majority of people that are getting um, having longer term effects or, or or more serious hospitalizations and even death. It, it tends to target the elderly folks, of course, there's no question, but there's no, you know, when it comes to the odds, you don't want to play the odds with your children's lives and health. Um, so, so people are hoping that there's going to be some kind of clarity of message. And with this, you know, like I, I keep calling it like a GOP team building exercise, because um, it's certainly not uh, much more than that. Um, uh, you know, when all things being equal, if you say what is the risk of taking a vaccine, these 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 vaccines have minimal risk. Yet the misinformation, disinformation, and the political stoking of preying on that for electoral, you know, uh, upsmanship for 2022 election cycle, uh, you know, and not to belabor this. I know we talk about this uh, pretty often when we get together, but the but the truth is that the the leadership. It's hard for there to be a clear a clear message uh, of leadership when it's uh, the that public health message gets undermined at every turn. Yeah, well, we'll see how the polling turns out because, you know, people are, uh, the polls, the, the poll, the talking heads uh, have been saying, well, you know, Biden has to own the lack of, of vaccination. He didn't meet his mandate and the rest. But given that the headlines are all that most of the vaccine resistance is happening in the red states, I do think people will actually distinguish uh, from that. Um <clears throat> but you know we'll we'll talk about that as as it, it develops of course biden isn't facing any re-election issues right now you know he's got <clears throat> a, a, an economy that appears to be doing the right thing except for a bit inflation at the moment um but uh it'll be real interesting to see um uh, what um, what what comes of these politics? Because if the if the pandemic extends into 2022, when it could have been stopped by vaccination, you know it's going to be a one of several very key um, election campaign issues. And and I did hear, you know, not to paint this all as doom and gloom, um, but when there are you know real cases in one's life where you see it, like. Uh, you know, when you know about the the lack, the, the 99.99 and change percent likelihood is if you're vaccinated, you're not going to get sick and have a complication. Uh, you might you might get the virus, you might test positive, but you won't be hospitalized or dead versus right. um, all these cases and all these hospitalizations, overwhelming uh, communities throughout the South. Um, I think that, you know, the, the positive here is that I did hear that I believe it was Tennessee that had like the the most vaccinations uh, in a week uh, recently. There's been this ramping up of people's, you know, who were formerly either less enthusiastic about it, maybe on the fence, not totally into it. Those folks, the the well, of moderate opinion or mild hesitancy, they're they're coming forward, which is a positive. All right. Well, obviously, we'll be talking about this probably every week for weeks, if not months to come, because it, there's just so many twists and turns in the story. Um, we'll see if the vaccine vaccination rates increase and once children under 12 can be vaccinated, if that starts to put it in to the story, at least the worst aspects of it. 
Another topic we've been discussing for the past few weeks, finally, the Senate uh, passed with, I believe, 69 votes, so well more than enough to override um, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, um, Man, my brain's not working today. <laughs> the the uh, what what is it when when people stand up and don't let a vote happen? Filibuster. Thank you, filibuster. <laughs> okay, I thought uh, that's it's, it's late in the day. Sorry, um, but the um, it, at any rate, the the filibuster it, it was enough to override it. Uh, more of the, the, most of the more conservative senators voted against it, but the the gang of ten all voted for it. Uh, Mankin Cinema, no problem. Uh, it's is going to be about five or six hundred billion uh, in new money reallocation of some money that didn't get spent um, from the um, uh, from the COVID relief. A uh, little bit of a controversy there. Um, and and passed. Um, and so now it all goes back to the House. But Nancy Pelosi has said, well, you know, not so fast. We will take care of this. But we also need to see the reconciliation bill, the three point five trillion bill that um, that the Democrats have been planning. Mankin and Cinema are being a little bit cagey, saying, well, that's a bit of money. They want to knock it down, saying we don't want to keep hyperinflation uh, or, or cause hyper inflation um, with that um, it, probably Mankin in particular might want to take some of the climate uh, change stuff out um, you know we'll see on the other side of it um, AOC and the squad and a lot of the progressive caucus are saying you got to make it worth our while too so Pelosi's going to have to walk a tightrope there's going to be discussions between the Senate and and the House uh, which almost shouldn't happen and there's no guarantee that the Senate uh, could pass a, a, anything more with regard to the bipartisanship, but the the question is is you know M will Mankin and Cinema stay in line uh, for reconciliation in the Senate, and uh, and if not, will the progressives stay in line um, in the House? Yeah, so so big picture, like you said, it's really it's a it's a even the even the bipartisan bill is relatively historic because uh, there has not been any positive movement on infrastructure since uh, George W. Bush was president. So for the last you know for three election presidential election cycles, uh, there mm -hmm. there ha there's not been any infrastructure. They have not even been able to do that. And uh, you know not that not that I'm patting myself on the back in any way, but this was my first prediction on <laughs> on this show about two months ago. How whenever we started, because it's one of those things where how do you not want to bring home billions of dollars or, or, or tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to, to your state or your community. So it just makes sense from a practical perspective, a political perspective. Um, it's it's not it's a nonpartisan issue. It should be. But so that said, um, where are we? And uh, today uh, I found out I uh, had a couple minutes to, to look into it. There was a Democratic caucus call and Nancy Pelosi uh, announced she's going to stick with the two part plan to bring both the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the budget reconciliation bill to the president by September 30th, and because that's when much of the government funding is going to set to expire. So they need this money for lots of reasons, not just um, the budget reconciliation, not just the, you know, for, for lots of reasons, they need the money to flow. Um, so um, two weeks, um, in two weeks after the break, the House is going to address the reconciliation bill, and Pelosi said um, she expects that these bills will advance to Biden's desk without drama. That's her way of saying, yeah, I know there's drama on this call, in this room, in our own party, you know, that's her perspective and, and within her party. She was saying, we don't need the drama. But that said, um, approximately 60 of the 100 of the progressive House members on the in their caucus are committed to blocking the bipartisan bill bill if it doesn't come accompanied with the budget reconciliation bill. Um, and Pelosi flat out said, like she said, um, I, this isn't me, uh, what she call it, uh, free, 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 freelancing or something like that. This is there. The votes are just not there. I can't move this forward without the progressive caucus. They have power here. So she kind of let everybody know that's what's up. It's like, she, yeah, she, she loses four votes and that's it. Yeah. yeah. So. so so the flip side of that is that the moderates are, are out there in full force. The moderate uh, groups, uh, two of them, one of them is called the uh, Blue Dog Caucus or and the other one's the Problem Solvers Caucus. Um, 
they realize that there's only a five vote majority in the House. And so they're basically saying that, like, well, our seats are in jeopardy and we would benefit immensely if you could just pass this bipartisan bill to show, take advantage of how popular it is. We could take it's still summertime with barbecues and, and we're going on break. Like, we want you to just pass this thing as soon as possible um, so that we can as evidence of a policy win back home. Um, and so they're looking for the GOP to support their case. So they they are making the case to Kevin McCarthy, uh, the House GOP leader, saying, OK, for uh, we got to do we got to do the whipping and counting here. Could could our moderates and your moderates get together and, and advance this bipartisan bill against, you know, because the, the squad is like six people. Yeah. Right. So, so, so that's actually happening. That that's that's in, in play. And um, I think that that's how the sausage gets made. And uh, we'll see how it plays out over the you know next uh, two months. That would be an interesting maneuver. Um, it, um, God, then, but I, I don't know that Biden would want that because the um, the the, the uh, squad and the Progressive Caucus, which I think is actually about a hundred members yeah. at this point, um, it w would be very angry with that if if they did that, and then it didn't lead to a reconciliation bill. Let, that being said. I think that the reconciliation bill will probably pass, even if they do it that way, because Mankin and uh, Manchin and Cinema aren't saying they're not going to vote for it. They want all. They want it to be altered, um, you know. And so then, what happens is, uh, what do the progressives do? Well, maybe they'll agree to a reduction in order for more urban money or something like that towards their things, and they'll they'll probably negotiate it the way things used to be done you know with the whole congress within within the democratic caucus so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens but it would be very interesting if mccarthy actually rallies um moderates to to support it all with um i i, I would expect that at that point the progressives will say, "Let's remember, Trump doesn't like this." You know, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I could just see that Trump absolutely wanted. We'll talk about that in another segment, but absolutely wanted to defeat the the thing. So there's a lot of intricate politics going around, um, and uh, bipartisanship is not a premium in politics at the moment. So that kind of bipartisanship, well, it'd be interesting to see what happens uh, if they actually do that. Uh, I I don't know if McCarthy has that type. Type of vision we'll see no i was gonna say like I, I figured you'd come back around to this i had a hunch that that's where you'd be and the truth is there's no evidence at all that uh, the republicans are playing ball uh, in the house mm -hmm. um but 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 if you look at the senate um i think that mansion and and um you know kirsten cinema kirsten cinema they they do like the idea of playing real hardball against their own party um and so the question is you know this is a massive bill up uh, the the bipartisan infrastructure bill is massive, but the but the you know budget reconciliation bill is epic large, three so, or more than three times. Yeah. yeah. So so realistically, like there's no way it's going to come through as is. It's gonna it, it gets approved in its current form in, in theory, but then it goes out to each of the committees that are affected, and they have to like maneuver their own pieces of it, and then also it's in in the uh, purview of the. Uh, uh, oh my God! What's it called? The um, the House parliamentarian to say no, this doesn't apply. Yes, this applies. Um, and so there's going to be huge swaths of things that are just cut on the face of it because they're going to be deemed not part of the budget. Like for example, the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage isn't even in there anymore because yeah. because they said nope, it doesn't apply. So what I'm getting at is the parliamentarian is going to be used as cover for certain things, um, and there's just going to be all sorts of uh, double speak for people like like Manchin to say, oh, this is going against coal. This is going for green energy. That must not be eligible to be in a budget reconciliation bill. We better ask the parliamentarian. And that's so that's just within the Democratic Party that there are all sorts of steps here that will uh, pair this back immensely. Yeah, although there's also um, a push to ignore the parliamentarian, but that's uh, and, and that'll be interesting. I mean, it's certainly not a constitutional, you no. know, guarantee that they have to follow what she says. It's just something they've relied on, kind of like the budget, uh, house budget, whatever it is. Um, the uh, but um, you know, it's a they, staff. Sorry, it's a staff position that has no power or authority. It's literally right. just an advisory role that they've been hiding behind as appropriate or or uh, you know as convenient. 
All right. Well, obviously, there's going to be plenty more on that. But the, historically, uh, the largest infrastructure bill ever has passed the Senate, will at some point, one way or another, pass in the House. Um, question is, is what's going to happen with the other bigger one? I don't think I've made mistakes. I mean, every time somebody says I made a mistake, they do the polls and my numbers go up. So I guess I haven't made any mistakes. We showed up and we demonstrated that we would not have our voices silenced by a Republican Party that across the country had a singular intention on suppressing the right to vote. Some Democratic senators seem to imagine they could just break the rules on a razor thin majority. Nothing would stand between them and their entire agenda. A new era of fast track policy. The Republican Party moved very far away from reality. And the fact that you got colleagues of mine in the Senate who refuse even today to acknowledge that Donald Trump lost the election. How do you deal with that? Joe Biden is the president we need right now. Battle tested, forward looking, honest and authentic. He has never forgotten who he is fighting for. All right. Well, we were talking a little bit about it, about Trump's influence on the party. Now, absolutely, Trump doesn't want any discussion or any investigation of January 6th that in any way, you know, suggests that this was a coup attempt or or anything. And there, and there are a lot of um, things that are happening behind the, the scenes, actually, not just in the House, but in, in the Senate um, Judiciary Committee. They're, they actually conducted an uh, a um, a uh, investigation of their own and, and actually deposed Rawson, um, you know, in, in a hurry before anybody could raise um, an objection to it or have Trump be filing a lawsuit. If this is going to lead to uh, apparently other um, things he, uh, that uh, other p potential witnesses, a lot of talks about, um, you know, how crazy this is going to get. But Trump doesn't is influencing the Republicans and absolutely not wanting to participate in this to give it any legitimacy. Uh, of course, but I think Republicans are getting frustrated because it also limits their ability to block the, anything. They certainly don't have any subpoena power. They don't have anything, you know, with their own investigation they're conducting. So, but Trump seems to have influence there. He has the win that we talked about last week, although he had a loss in Texas, you know, in terms of his endorsements. Um, but with infrastructure, they just completely ignored him, at least 19 Republicans. Um, you know, uh, so does he own the party at this point or doesn't he or how complicated is it? Yeah, I, I would um, agree with what you've said, and and it is complicated. And and so as we talked about last week, um, you know, it's on the endorsement front, um, he did, uh, you know, his his preferred candidate Susan Wright lost in Texas, but his preferred candidate Mike Carey did win in Ohio. Um, so so he it, his endorsement carries some weight. It's it's not we're not talking about its ending. And that's because he remains popular with the base. And then also um, the chairwoman of the GOP um, said recently that he's still the leader of the GOP. So so again, that's this again, not to be a broken record, but the the uh, team building exercise benefits from them continuing to keep Trump in the in the spotlight because um, he you know the, he's popular with the base so so that there's the endorsement side and i have to give a hat tip to uh ryan lisa at politico because he kind of broke this down and and this is not you know this is not my original thought he, he said this but behind the scenes people do in congress people are complaining about how hard it is to navigate this where um the bipartisan infrastructure bill is really important and so for some people um that they chose to to go their own way against the base against trump's purported base and like you said including Mitch McConnell so that's a signal because he's the leader giving people um, space to uh, you know to, to be independent somewhat independent because typically Mitch McConnell forces folks into you know very strict uh, you know stay in line and vote with vote as a block but in this case he gave them space to do so um, because it was bipartisan in nature of course um, but also in the Senate, he had influence. So anybody who's up for re-election or interested in a leadership role, they did vote against it. So, so those people, even though they had the flexibility to do it, they still maintained that posture. Yeah. Um, and, and also you know, in the House side, um, Kevin McCarthy originally very critical of Trump on the, the you know January 6th issue, but has you know backtracked it immensely and allowed um, Trump 
spokespeople he at least tried to put you know uh, Jordan on the committee and others who um, were you know obviously toting the party line and finally fundraising and this is the big one um, it's still the case that he sells and raises money but he just lost um, last week the Trump the Trump yeah. uh, team agreed to return almost 77 million dollars million dollars <laughs> because of unethical fundraising practices registering people for recurring payments without full and clear disclosure yeah so 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 um, he can bring in big money. He's showing that he can bring in big money and people want that for 2022. So he candidates will try to curry favor with him in areas where they think they can that, that will help them with the base. The RNC also had to give back some money. Uh, you know, I mean, it's graft. That's what it is. They're basically taking money, you know, as if it was theirs, you know, and uh, it's but, you know, it's just we're we're in that um, th that realm of politics where they can just get away with it. I, you know, I mean, I, OK, it's good that they're giving the money back, but somebody should probably be going to jail. But that's just, you know, uh, <laughs> that's that's another issue. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, they, they again, the Trump influence can only go so far. McCarthy is, of course, sweating the fact that he might be a witness. Jim Jordan uh, had a press conference where he was rambling, not making any sense because, you know, he because he's scared about it. Well, he's already been kind of cagey. Well, yes, I talk to him. I talk to him all the time. Right. You know, I mean, and uh, and not really understand. And then I don't know about Jim Jordan's phone call on January 6th with with Trump, but McCarthy's was overheard by other people who have already uh, at least signed a declaration during the, the, the trial who also will be asked. So McCarthy has to be very careful about anything he says, which, you know, under oath, which could amount to perjury. Um, it, you know, and here he is, the, the leader of the Republicans, and he's going to be on the hot seat eventually. And they're probably, uh, the Democrats are probably going to wait for that for last until we're fully into the um, uh, 2022 election. Election campaign probably in the spring, if not later. You know, they're, there's they're not in a hurry. They're going to drag this thing out. Uh, they've already had some, you know, good testimony for their cause about the, with the police. Everybody calling them the Republicans trying to call them crisis actors. I don't think that that's going to sell well. Um, and um, and it's you know this is just a, a long term thing. And Trump has them in a bind because they can't get in there and and play it and try to soften the role because. They don't have a bipartisan commission. I, again, I, I, you know, this is one of my sort of prediction, broader predictions, but I think that the Republicans are going to regret not ha having blocked the bipartisan commission because it's going to take a very different tone. Yes, it's biased and all that, but the problem is, is no matter how biased you are, that doesn't have any impact on what the witnesses say that are being, you know, watched by the media and possibly live, uh, um, you know, live in front of everybody. Um, and that's going to have more power than anything. And they don't even have the ability to cross-examine them now. So, you know, they, Jim Jordan can't get up there and interrupt after ask a question. Somebody gets two words out and he interrupts to try to frame it his way. He can't do that. Of course, like I said, he's probably going to be interviewed himself. So I, I think that um, there are a lot of Republicans that have been for a long time really um, angry with Trump. You know, over what he's doing with the influence on his party, but you're right, it's a fundraiser. Uh, that 30 percent that won in Ohio, um, you know, that's about what the base is, right? 30 30 percent. Uh, you know, it was a plurality. He didn't win by any kind of majority. There were about a dozen Republican candidates, so I'm not even sure how much the pride Trump should even take in that. You know, if, if he'd got more than 50 percent, you'd be saying, OK, he's ruling the party. But 70 percent of Republicans did not vote for his candidate. That's, you know, so I, anyway, uh, it'll be real interesting to see, you know, where it goes. But we've seen this before. Cruz was resentful that his wife was attacked and and his father was accused of assassinating Kennedy. And um, what happens? Cruz falls in line. You know, that, that's um, I, I, I just, you know, I it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But I am thinking that Trump's influence is still strong, but it's waning. I don't think it's going to get uh, to where it was before. And then just a final thought here is that um, 
we didn't speak today about, and but we have in the past about the legal troubles of Trump and his organization, right. and uh, and there's a the, you know this the uh, the circle is is getting smaller around him for liabilities, um, and we'll just leave it there because you know we, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of all these lawsuits and the potential lawsuits. But but so there's the financial crimes, potential alleged financial crimes of the organization, but but beyond that um, the uh, you could call it a conspiracy, but there's a lot of communication history out there, whether it's social media, emails, phone calls, texts, um, where they coordinated activities around January 6th. And, and people like people like Jordan, I think, are going to be you know caught up in that crossfire, too. Yeah. And, and his district is going to be redistricted, but that's a whole other story. Um, well, we will be talking about it, but I am thinking that Trump is going to be less and less gradually, very gradually, less and less of a topic over the next couple of years. Um, and, um, you know, we'll we'll see, or at least over the next few months, but we're still talking about them here and now. Um, so anyway, that takes us, uh, to, speaking of uh, Trumpian politician, that takes us to the next topic. I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. So help me God. All right. Uh, governor, former Governor Cuomo, New York Governor Cuomo, resigned yesterday um, after a devastating report came out. A lot of people weren't expecting him to because he was doubling down on his defenses, a lot like Trump. I think you know. He, I think he probably figured, hey, I, only half as many women are accusing me as accused Trump. I can ride this out. But he had no support in the party, none, zero, after that report came out. Um, oh, I, I, I be corrected. He is still governor for the next 13 days. Um, the new governor, the um, forgetting her name, but she's the lieutenant governor, has already uh, talked about it. But um, Kathy, yeah. uh, Kathy Hochul. Good job. Good job. Um, anyways, um, so the um, any, anyway, um, you know, he. He was a, a year and some change ago. He was actually seen as possibly winning, defeating Trump in, in as a dark horse candidate uh, for the Democrats and being president. How how the mighty have fallen. Um, it just and, and of course Republicans are being putting out a cynical line. They're saying, well, he murdered all those people in the nursing homes, but you know Democrats only care when it's about sexual harassment. You know, and it's just. Um, uh, anyway, it's the uh, uh, but it is what brought him down because it's a devastating report. Unlike the Star report, it was done by somebody within his own party, the Attorney General, um, somebody who had actually even been uh, kind of allied with him at one point, um, and um, he was defiant for a few days, and then I think the pressure was just put on him because he got he had no backers. I, the only person who was kind of backing him was Rudy Giuliani, probably not the backer he wanted, right? Uh, Trump, of course, was calling for his uh, resignation, but uh, you know that, uh, that that's going to be interesting. Republicans are are kind of, oh Bobert today. Uh, the kind of, she came out and said, "Oh, good riddance to the creep," and uh, that was on Twitter. And there was a Twitter, it set a Twitter fire because her husband has been accused of some pretty bad stuff, um, exposing himself to women uh, and, and the rest. And uh, he actually was arrested. I don't know if he's been convicted. I don't know where the charges are. But they said, you know, hey, to, to, you know, come back and talk when your husband has faced justice uh, or when you've said, spoken up about Trump or Matt Gates, right? You know, and uh, they just blast her out of the water. She just disappeared from Twitter for the day. Um, <clears throat> but it's it, the politics is really really interesting because Republicans are actually kind of quiet. Uh, maybe they're sitting back watching, hoping the Democrats tear themselves apart, but they didn't seem to do that. The Democrats were unified uh, as and as one of the uh, editorials went, 
Cuomo was in the wrong party for this. Uh, you know, it's um, it, it's it's not something that the company should have learned from Al Franken, whose um, transgressions were much less egregious, but still serious enough that he got drummed out pretty quickly. Um, and um, anyway, uh, it made a good victory for the Me Too movement and a, a good uh, and a, for the Democrats to show that. Maybe they aren't quite as hypocritical as across the aisle. I don't know. Um, but they they sure turned on him. Yeah, so I, I saw an article out there uh, in Politico, and unfortunately I didn't take down the author's name, so I apologize, but I'm going to – another hat tip. But they, they kind of got into the nitty-gritty. And so before I before I talk about the nitty-gritty of the, of the moment, just backstory, because I don't think we talked about this before, but Andrew Cuomo was – the uh, Housing and Urban Development Secretary under Bill Clinton, yes. um, and he ma was married to Bobby Kennedy's, one of Bobby Kennedy's daughters, and so he was in this Camelot uh, inner circle. That's part of the reason why there was this tractor beam to the top for him, um, you know, not judging his, his uh, political skills or his policy acumen. I just know that when it comes to fundraising and, and networks, he, he was right up there with the best of them. Um, and so, um, he, you know, he, there was a falling out, so he wasn't like the favored child or anything. He ended up getting a divorce, but uh, but still he he was governor. Um, and the timing of this was a, was a great surprise because his general leadership style was that he's very much of a bully and that he's all in on all things. And so he was planning to fight. Um, the uh, timing was, like I said, a surprise. He, he uh, um, gave all signals that he was going to fight the impeachment process. His personal lawyer went on TV uh, to challenge the accusers. Um, and the, le the whole impeachment process was going to play out over weeks and months. So he thought he had a chance. He said, hey, if this is a long-term thing, I might be able to do this. Let's get some accommodation from the uh, from the Speaker of the Assembly here in the, in the state legislature so that I can continue to lead. And the leadership, um, you know, that was the final straw that broke the camel's back. It all happened really quickly, um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, where, um, you know, he told all his volunteers, yeah, you guys can you guys can still volunteer. Like, we're still doing this. I'm still running for reelection in 2022. And um, but his inner circle shrunk down as small as his core family group, aides and loyalists, like they fit in a room. So it was a very small group of people. Um, and and like I said, finally, on, on Monday, when the assembly speaker sa said straight up publicly, I'm on the record, there's going to be no bargaining. He's getting impeached. He's gone. We're doing this. Um, so basically, um, there was that 11 count report from Attorney General Tish James, which I think was made a little bit worse when um, news came out that um, – one of the people who is a staff member at from Times Up, which is an organization established to support women who face harassment and unethical or illegal behavior, that there was a her she was part of the planning team to work to assist Governor Cuomo in his defense against the accusers, um, and that that just looked terrible for the whole movement. And anybody who was kind of like, yeah, we can keep fighting for him, was like, we have to back off. So so um, you know, like I said, not that I know, but uh, but the Politico uh, article did say that once he lost the support of the Speaker of the House formally, publicly, like we are definitely bringing you down. No no. No way, fans or butts about it. The next morning, he woke up and and told his inner inner circle that it was the end of it on Tuesday. Yeah, um, and at any rate, the um, what we need to remember um, with this is that the you know the, these women came out with very graphic depictions of things. One difference with with Trump is that Trump did all of his stuff when he was out of office. So far, there are no allegations that he did it while he was in office. Uh, Matt Gates, well, Matt Gates is probably going to jail. We'll, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. But the, um, but, you know, I, definitely um, this was a, a huge, you know, Cuomo was the son of Mario Cuomo, who was the beloved, um, you know, leader who gave an outstanding Democratic Party Congressional, uh, Democratic uh, Party uh, Convention a uh, speech in 1984 that had a lot of people thinking he'd be president, ended up losing an election during the um, Republican Revolution of, of 1994. But, you know, it's just he was seen as as one of the honest candidates, um, honest politicians. And it's a shame that that legacy is now I, I, tarnished as a, a soft way of saying it. 
Uh, and I was just going to mention, not, not that I'm happy about this, because I even said it last week. Um, this was my prediction last week was that I thought it would happen quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know how quickly, but that that it just seemed that this was, you know, the situation was an untenable situation, given that he's a Democrat. And um, yeah, you know, truth be told, it's not it's not something that's that's in any way, you know, I got my prediction right. But but it, you just read the tea leaves here and it just it just really did seem that no matter what positives he had and support he had um, from his, you know, his family legacy and, and all those supporters around him um it just you know it's not it was the wrong moves at the wrong time and, and yeah and it was too much that he was molesting a trooper assigned to protect him that's really bad imagery uh he, he in his speech he tried to say well uh it, it you know i i understand that uh my touching and affectionate uh, ways are outdated and generational. That's a defense that maybe Biden has, you know, uh, with, with with his touchiness. But uh, but it, for, if if what these women were saying were true, it was well beyond that. So, I mean, it's uh, you know we'll, we'll see um, you know what comes of it. But this may revive the the strength of the Me Too movement, and maybe a few other people won't be out there. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the politics of Missouri, where uh, the Republican who basically tied a woman up nude, took pictures of her, and and blackmailed her into silence um, can can prevail. Uh, there's a little bit of division in the Trump camp about that uh so you know but uh, you know we'll, we'll see we'll see what happens with this but hopefully the winner in this you know in, in this very tragic situation was uh was the me too movement and maybe new york you know i don't know what kind of leader this woman is going to make um i seriously doubt that she's groped any of her uh, you know people under her um but you know hopefully it it, it will turn the page and, and we'll see i'll also be curious to see if there are any investigations into the controversies around the nursing homes so coming back home across uh across the country to the pacific uh we have a recall election that's heating up uh republican candidates are all have their uh, out with their knives. They are all vying to see who will be number one. Nobody's got any more than I think 20% of, of the support of the Republicans right now, let alone anybody else. Um, but what is uh, scaring Democrats is a recent poll had um, the no vote only up by 3%. I I actually think that it's probably a bit of a mirage um, because I do people when they take polls sometimes want to send messages with their answers in polls. And there is a lot of dissatisfaction um, with um, with uh, uh, Newsom on, on a bunch of levels. On the other hand, the economy is going pretty well. Um, the um, you know, but there is this fire raging um in in the background uh, pardon me in in the east the now the second biggest fire in our history um it, it uh, and republicans and especially doug lamalfa uh who is the congressional representative of um of the first district of california uh you know shasta county and siskiyou and all that um is uh making partisan blaming uh, Newsom on it. Uh, some of them are blaming Newsom for I'm not quite sure what, um, but uh, but somehow blaming him uh, and and, um, and and see the climate change thing as a deflection. A lot of people are saying, well, they need to have more reservoirs. Well, you know, the Oroville Reservoir closed last week, uh, it shut down its power because it's so low, and and not wanting to deal with the fact that there is no snow in the mountains. That's why we've got conditions we. Have haven't had the rain that uh, we need to maintain forests as they are. Um, but they, they want it. But at any rate, there is. And then there is the general feeling of dread because of the um, of, of the COVID situation, which maybe kind of plays against all leadership. Maybe there just is dissatisfaction out there. But it is close, uh, according to one poll uh, within three percent. Still no, still ahead. I don't think it's that close. But it's close enough that Newsom and the Democrats ought to really think about their approach. 
Yeah, so it's it's funny that you say that because the the uh, the approach is certainly something I'm going to touch on too. Um, so as you said, you know, I looked at real clear real clear politics, and um, the overall average of all polls is that there are 48 percent in favor of um, recalling him and 46 against recalling him, which is within the margin of error, basically. So so if you add up all the polls, it doesn't look good. Um, there's one poll that was a real outlier, which I think that you know, you'll know you see on Fox News uh, probably, which says it's 51% to 40%, which I, I don't trust that one, honestly, but um, I have no reason to think that they cheated in any way. It just seems a little out of yeah. whack compared to the others. Um, and I say cheated, I mean tinkered with the methodology. Uh, one way that the methodologies get tinkered with just so we know so everyone's clear about it is that you filter on likely voters where that works in your favor but then you don't filter on likely voters where it doesn't so there's there's different ways to do that um, but anyway the election is September 14th right around the corner one month away and for folks who just you know haven't been paying close attention the way it works is question one is do we recall him yes or no and it's 50 percent plus one vote if they say yes then he's out and then it goes to question two who is going to replace and there's about 40 candidates um, and so someone could win with a split vote at a very low percentage, which is what happened in the recall where Arnold Schwarzenegger won. He had around 40 percent of the vote. I think right now no one's polling even more than 20, like you said. Um, and I keep forgetting this guy, uh, Larry Elder, yeah. the conservative radio talk show host. Yes. Uh, he, he seems to be one of their front runners if not the front runner uh, of the GOP on question two. So it's it's looking very real that this guy could get some traction. Um, postcards already went out in the mail. Uh, I got mine in the last day or two that says you're about to get a ballot. Ballots are gonna be here within a week. Um, so I, you said, now what's the Democrats approach? Um, I think this is not any kind of insider information at all. Everything, every time I see Democratic communication about this, they're saying it's the Republican recall. Right. And with the way they're framing it is that the big issues, um, uh, California state governor's response to the COVID pandemic, they are framing it as the same way that people are framing the COVID response nationally by the GOP, which is the closing of the economy and the mask mandate was a failure and, and, it's, and it harmed us and we need to do something about it. Those are the big issues. Uh, we can talk about the smaller issues in more detail. I know you did a little bit. I'm just going to rattle a few off. Um, other criticisms are like the kitchen sink, throwing everything at him. They're blaming Gavin Newsom for California's crime rate, mm -hmm. homeless rate, unemployment rate, too much taxes and too much regulations, high cost of living, too many wildfires, too much drought. Um, so that's all they're, they're just throwing everything and seeing what sticks. Well, I, let me ask you what, what, what you think here. And I do think that ultimately a lot of Democrats are going to consider because the Democrats will get the message out that if a Republican becomes governor, especially someone like Elder, um, and some health issue happens with Dianne Feinstein, the Democrats lose their slim majority in the Senate. Um, do they want that to happen? I think that's going to be the factor in, in the long run. But let me ask you about the strategy that uh, Newsom and the Democrats are taking, because they did this last time. I remember being angry with Dianne Feinstein the last time around with the Schwarzenegger Davis recall is that they had a viable candidate, Cruz Bustamante, uh, who uh, you know got a respectable amount of votes. But Diane Feinstein and people were saying, "Well, I'm not going to endorse anybody in the second half because you should vote no uh, on the recall." And I just, you know, that's uh, that seems very risky in light of what happened at that time. I thought it was irresponsible over at the time, but they're really pushing: don't even vote on on the second one, just vote no. Um, and, you know, I, like I said, I don't think there's, I, I would give the recall maybe about a 20% chance. I actually think that's generous. I'm giving it a 20% chance of, of, of passing because I do think the Democrats are going to get the message. I think they want to send a message to Newsom in the poll of taking, but I think that they are going to get that message and there's just too many Democratic voters to go that way. Um, the, um, you know, the Republicans in the Valley might be pushing the fire thing, but the economy on the coast is actually going pretty good. Uh, you know, um, the, um, the, 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 uh, 
coronavirus thing isn't working out all that badly in the urban areas because San Francisco actually achieved virtual herd immunity over 90% of their people vaccinated, right? So, so and, and that's where the people live in those areas. That's why it's such a democratic um, state right now. So I don't think it's going to happen, but I just, what, what do you think about the strategy of not putting somebody up who's viable, who could even go through and make the, the point of their campaign vote no on the recall you know um but um but but still uh you, you know it, at least you've got that backup um but boy they're putting all their eggs in the one basket is that a mistake it was a mistake last time around so i'm not going to go so far as to say it's a mistake um but what i would say is i don't agree with it in my my own my own calculation is that um it can't hurt to have a front running backup voice out there as the the tip of the spear so to speak of the vote no movement right and right. and just have that person out there so that you know you know John Doe says vote no like whatever it is you know like ha like at least put up somebody but they 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 they're very confident it appears in their numbers in the state and it's a turnout game for them and if they're able to take their democratic majority and and leverage and parlay the governor's popularity amongst the you know the in this case the base is like the whole party not just i'm not talking about you know active voters but but people who say that they are democrats make up about two out of three of active voters um so if they can mobilize the base minimally or, or moderately then they have a very solid advantage and because of that they're playing it very close to the to the wire here as opposed to proactively you know making that case that you described and i would take it one step further um i think it'd be important to go on the merits full hog, whole hog and and talk about the covid response because you there's a lot of unregistered you know, non-partisan rather registered people who are vote, vote, registered as non-partisan those people aren't going to be automatically reflexively supporting him and they're not going to want to really get sucked into the let's vote him out because of covid because that just seems kind of like it you know it, we had a we had a solid response here in california and if nothing else it was effectively the same response of everyone else um so the strategy that the country used is the same strategy that all the countries used you know every country put in place a strategy of closing the economy down supporting workers uh mask mandates etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, vaccination when it came out so so just just supporting what happened um i think would be like be on message, not like just think that you have the numbers to your advantage is the only thing where you need to apply pressure. All right. Well, we'll obviously be covering that. And again, yes, you will. Everybody will be receiving your ballots within days, probably. So uh, that takes us to our final segment of predictions. All right, and now it's time for predictions. I'm gonna keep this one short because it's uh, we just talked about it at length. But um, I'm going to predict that Governor Newsom survives the recall vote, and and the the recall no uh, gets that 50% plus one that they need, uh, basically because it's just it's seemingly a fruitless 276 million dollar cost. Uh, nobody needed to do. There's no reason to do it. Um, vote him out if you don't like him. But I think the recall itself was was an exercise in futility, and that'll probably play. I think it'll play out that way. All right, my prediction is long term. It'll be it's a, it'll be my first prediction of for the 2022 election. Lisa Murkowski uh, has been is the consummate moderate. She's the only Republican who voted for impeachment twice. Um, she is. Um, Targeted by uh, Trump, who is uh, has opposed her. Pardon me, has backed her primary opponent, Chewbacca. Cool name for a geek like me, but uh, that it's spelled differently. But um, it's um, but you know a woman who is much more in line with Trump's politics and way of thinking. Um, at one point, Chewbacca was, and and the other Republican candidates were way out ahead of her. Uh, but even if she loses in the Republican primary, I think I believe she'll run like an independent. She's done this before. And this time she has ranked choice voting 
behind her. I am predicting that Murkowski wins a second term, wins big, and that may be one of the death blows to Trumpism in the party, uh, because Trump has gone all out to, to get her out of office. And with that, those are our predictions, uh, and, and that is the show. Uh, we will be back next week, probably at least two or three of the same topics because they are just ongoing um, stories, but who knows what's going to come up um, next. Until next time, keep thinking. <laughs>